Would you take God's word this morning, please, and open to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, we've been doing a study, and we're in chapter 2 this morning, and we want to look at verses 13 down to verse 20. Would you stand for the reading of God's word, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13? For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews." who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, Endeavored the more abundantly to see your faith with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, we come with a reverent heart to your precious word. And we pray, Lord, that as we study it, you'll open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things. Challenge us, Lord, and draw us near. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I want to talk today about standing firm during persecution. Whenever one talks about persecution in the American church, it kind of seems useless. I mean, whenever I bring up the subject of persecution, people already, they kind of start to yawn. Persecution, what do you mean persecution? And that is because the church in America has been without serious persecution. I've been to uh, other countries in the world where believers are under persecution, and believe me, there is a difference. There's a distinct difference in the way that believers in those countries worship God than Christians in America. There seems to be a desperation for God in places like that that's missing in American churches. But I believe the persecution will come to America one day. I don't want to be a prophet of gloom here today. I just want to be realistic. But if you read church history, you'll find that church history is the history of persecution to believers. This American liberty that we are experiencing is really just a parenthesis on the long sentence of Christian history. It's not going to last forever. Persecution will come. The question is not if, it's when. It'll be interesting to see how believers respond. I believe unless there is a widespread revival in America, the persecution of Christians will grow in the next few years. We're already seeing just a little bit of it. I mean, it's not too bad, but we're seeing the opposition that's being given to the church. We, have, we see businesses fined, and even people forced out of businesses because of alleged discrimination against LGBTQ. Do I got all those letters right there? There's pressure from both the government and from politically correct corporations to force everyone to allow men who identify themselves as women to use women's restroom and shower facilities. We see that. I, I, I read this week of a graduate student working on a counseling degree that was forced out of her degree because she said that she would refer homosexual clients to other counselors because of her her religious belief. Uh, Several states have already passed laws that prohibit licensed counselors from trying to help homosexual clients become heterosexual and is now being looked upon. If you start to share the gospel with a homosexual person, hoping to convert them to Jesus Christ, and for them to repent of their sin, that's considered conversion therapy. That's against the law in certain places. Already it's against the law in Canada, and it's coming to us, I believe. Again, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but I believe that churches and other ministries 
that hold to a biblical view of morality will lose their tax-exempt status one day. Military chaplains may be forced to perform homosexual weddings or lose their commissions. And on we could go. Public school teachers might be fired for refusing to teach, quote-unquote, diversity tolerance to their students. Christian colleges and seminaries may lose their accreditation if they do not endorse LBGTQ rights. So we, at Faith Theological Seminary, we are going through the process of getting accreditation. And uh, part of that is jumping through all the hoops that Maryland Higher Education Commission puts out there. And we want to be accredited because we want our, our education, our academics to be recognized as quality, which I believe they are, but you need to have that state accreditation. But I'm going to here to tell you, folks, if the state of Maryland starts to tell us that we have to do things that are not according to the Scripture, you can forget that accreditation. We're going to stand firmly on the Word of God. But a lot of these things are being forced on churches. Already pastors in places like Sweden and England and Canada have been arrested for preaching what the Bible says about morality. So I think that we're headed in that direction. And already, because of the pandemic, the the government kind of had a taste of what it could do to tell the church how to worship and when to worship and what to do in worship and all those things. I think that's just a foreshadowing of things to come. Now, I'm not trying to be negative here today. I just recognize uh, what Scripture teaches, that's all. And Paul's dealing with this very subject to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonian believers were going through severe persecution. And I think that all of us that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that love his word, that want to stand firm on the truth will be tested. The question is, when persecution comes, will you stand firm or will you capitulate to this godless culture? Now, this is what Paul's dealing with again here to the Thessalonians. He talks about what they had gone through since they had come to Jesus Christ as Savior And notice the words that Paul uses. In chapter 1, verse 6, he talked about uh, how that they received the word in much affliction, the word affliction there, pressure from circumstances. In chapter 2, verse 14, he used the word suffered. That's the same word to speak about the suffering of our Lord Jesus. In chapter 2, verse 15, he also used the word persecuted, which means to be driven out and rejected. Again, he uses in verse 15 the word contrary, which is used to speak of winds that blow against or hinder progress. In chapter 2, verse 18, he talks about being hindered by Satan. And yet, despite all of the persecution that the believers at the church of Thessalonica received, they were standing firm. They were moving forward. Now, how is that possible? And by the way, the Bible says they did it with great joy. They did it with joy. How is that possible? How could that be possible for us today? How are we going to stand firm when the time comes? Well, I want you to see three resources that I think Paul mentions here that will help us to stand firm. Here's the first one. Number one, the Bible within us. Look again in verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Beloved, God's word is our source of strength. Our salvation is based on the word of God, which gives us the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the same word that saves us is the word that strengthens us and the word that will help us to endure suffering. And Paul is rejoicing. He's giving thanks to God because of these Thessalonians, because of the way that they had received God's word. He was so thankful for them. They had the right attitude towards the word of God. Let me ask you a question. What is God's word to you? Is it just another book? Is it a book that bores you, that you never pick up and read? And let me just say, beloved, if the only time you read the Bible is on Sunday, then then you're seriously lacking in your Christian life. There should be a hunger in your heart for the Word of God. What you think about the Bible says a lot about you. What you do with the Bible will determine what God does with you. There are two things about the Thessalonians 
that they did with God's word that we have to do. First of all, they received it. He says in verse 13, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. When Paul went to the church, to, the, to Thessalonica, the city there, to plant a church, he didn't give them his own philosophies of life. He didn't tell them interesting stories to humor them. He didn't give them his opinion on matters of faith in life. He didn't give his political opinion on issues. He gave them the inspired living word of God. That's why several times in this letter, Paul refers to his message as the gospel of God. Beloved, the Bible is not just another book. It is of divine origin. It is superior to any book ever written. Now, the the Thessalonians, they were accustomed to hearing teachers that would come by. In that time, there were traveling teachers of wisdom called sophist teachers that went from town to town giving speeches and great or, using great oratory to hold people spellbound. They did it all for money. And so that city there, Thessalonica, located on a super highway, would have all kind of tr- teachers that would come through giving Greek wisdom or their own philosophy. And so the Thessalonians were accustomed to people coming to town giving their ideas all the time. But when they heard Paul, there was something different about Paul. They didn't hear a man giving his own philosophy. He wasn't giving just another version of human wisdom. They knew that the words that Paul spoke were not the words of men, but it was the word of God. And it rang true in their heart as the word of God. They heard the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And, And Paul says, you received it. Two times in verse 13, he uses the word receive. Now, these are two different Greek words, same English word. First time they use the word receive, it's the word paralambano. Lambano means to greet as a friend. They welcome God's word. You put the pair on the front of it, that's a prefix that intensifies the word. They they totally welcomed it. They welcomed it with open arms. You, You ever welcome someone that way? You know, the last week we had the privilege of a having my grandkids come. You know, my daughter lives in London. She has three boys, another daughter that lives in Tennessee, two little girls, and they rarely are they here at the same time, but they were all here. My house bears witness to that. (laughs) But I tell you, when, like you, when, when your family member you haven't seen in a while and they come, how do you welcome them? I mean, I pick those little ones up and hug them like I'm never gonna let them go. And that's the idea here with this word, paralambano. You welcome the word of God with all your heart. That's the idea. The second time he uses the word receive, it's a different Greek word. It's dekomai. And it means an inward welcome to receive it down deep into the heart. You remember when Jesus gave the parable of the sower? He sowed seed on the soil. And some soil only received the word superficially, or I'm sorry, received the seed, which represents the word superficially. It just got, you know, right down just below the surface. That seed did not bear fruit. But the seed that bore fruit, or the soil that bore fruit, received the seed way down deep. The word that was used there is decomai. It received it inwardly. It received it deeply. That is the idea here behind this word. How did the Thessalonians receive the word of God? They received it deeply in their heart because they recognized it not as the word of man, but as absolutely the word of God. Scottish missionary Alexander Duff set sail for Holland in 1829. He had all his belongings on board, and he had 800 select volumes also that he brought on the journey. But on the journey, there was a storm and the ship was wrecked. But Duff and his friends were saved. And they stood on the shore, seeing if there was something from the ships that might wash ashore, anything that they could salvage. And while they were looking, there was only one thing that they saw. They saw a book bobbing up and down in the waves. And they went and they retrieved it. And, they, and guess what it was? It was Alexander Duff's Bible. All the other books were lost. What a parable. You can't drown God's word, beloved. The word of men will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. 
You see, the, the way you regard God's word says a lot about you. It, it, really, uh, we, we should receive the word of God. In essence, it, it's all about Christ. That's why it's so precious to us. He's the living word. The Bible is the written word. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, but God's word is also called bread. Jesus is the light, but God's word is a, a light unto our path. Jesus said, I'm the truth, and God's word is the truth. The Holy Spirit gave birth to Jesus through a holy woman. God gave birth to the Bible through holy men of God. And so there's a, there's a parallel there. Do you receive God's word as it is, the word of God? Friend, I want to tell you something. When I come here and I preach, I'm committed to giving you the word of God. Not my opinion because I'm nothing. What I, my opinion doesn't matter. It only matters what God says and that we understand what God says. So when you come to God's house, please listen reverently to the word of God and please receive it. Jesus said in Luke 8:18, 8, take heed therefore how you hear. They received it, but also you have to believe it. That's the next thing we see of them. This is another way of reverencing God's word. Do you believe what it says? Uh, notice what it says again in verse number 13. At the end it says, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They believe the truth of the scripture. Do you believe what the Bible says? There's a lot of people that say they do, but do they really? We, we had the privilege of having Dr. Terry Mortensen here last week. I hope you were here to hear him. And he reminded us again of how that there are people out there that call themselves Christians that don't hold to the word of God. They, they put the opinion and the philosophy of man above the scripture, above what God's word says. They question when the Bible says God created the world in six days. They say, oh, well, you know, it wasn't a 24-hour day. It, it was, the word day had to mean an age. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to squeeze in evolution into the word of God. The Bible says there was evening, there was morning, day one. How much clearer does God have to be on that? Amen. The world was created in six literal days. They say Adam was not a literal historical person, but rather a myth, which we saw completely is an attack on the gospel because if Adam was a myth, then what is sin? And if there's no sin, then there's no need for a Savior, Jesus Christ. The strategy of Satan from the very beginning is to get people to question the word of God. You can hear the serpent's hiss in his words, yea, has God said? Did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? When we question God's word, we call him a liar. But Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. Do you believe the word of God? Let me just show you something real quick. Go to, go to Jeremiah chapter 17. I want to show you this. It's worth you seeing. It's one of my favorite passages, and I've probably showed it to you before. I'm sure I have, but I want you to see it again. Because here in Jeremiah 17, there's a contrast between the word of man or trusting in man and trusting in God. Look at Jeremiah 17, look at verse 5. What do, we, what do you get when you trust in man and his word? Verse 5, thus says the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man, <clears throat> that maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land not inhabited. But notice the contrast in verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh. But her leaves shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You see the contrast? If you trust in man, you're cursed. If you trust in God, you're blessed. If you trust in men, your heart departs from the Lord. If you trust in God, your heart depends on the Lord. If you trust in men, it's compared to a heath in the desert, a drought. If you trust in God, it's like an oasis. If you trust in men, you're blind to blessings. You don't see when the good comes. But if you trust in men, you're blind to burdens. If you want to place your trust in man over God, that's up to you. But this is what you can expect if you do. 
I choose to trust in God's word. When I was a kid, I picked up my father's Bible one day, and he, had, he wrote a marginal note that I never forgot. In Genesis 1-1, he wrote in the margin, in the beginning, God, and I believe all the rest. And I do too. So when persecution comes, how are we going to stand firm? The Bible within us, holding to the word of God. But here's the second thing, the believers around us. Look again in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 2, look at verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things for your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men. We must realize that when we're persecuted for our faith, we're not the only ones to ever experience this. You know, sometimes when believers go through suffering or persecution, we have a tendency to think, you know, that we're the only ones. But that's simply not true. If you suffer for your faith, you, are, you get into a line, a long line of godly people that stretches all the way back to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You're in a good, elite line of people. And this is what Paul's reminding the believers about. Look, don't be surprised when it happens, don't be surprised if it comes. Peter wrote to the believers in Rome, and he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as so some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. In other words, God chose you for this. He later wrote this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Listen, the afflictions that you're going through, it's, you're not the only one. There have been others. Don't be surprised. So this is an important thing to know when you go through suffering, that you're not the only one. I mean, read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. Look at the prophets in the Old Testament. Read the New Testament and look at the disciples. You'll read of godly people who suffered from Abel all the way to Zechariah, from A to Z. You'll see all these people. Read the biographies of great Christians and great missionaries, and you'll find the common denominator is they suffered. Get a magazine like The Voice of the Martyrs and read about how that even in our present world now, there are people that are being persecuted and some being martyred for their faith. There's an organization called Open Doors that makes a report of these things, and I read the statistics that according to Open Doors, Listen to this, globally, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution for their faith. 360 million. In 1993, Christians face high to extreme levels of persecution in 40 countries. That number has nearly doubled to 76 countries in 2023. 312 million Christians now face very high or extreme levels of persecution. According to Open Doors, the total number of Christians killed for their faith in 2022 was 5,898 that were killed for their faith. In 2023, so far, it is 5,621. And so Paul reminds the Thessalonians, he said, look, when you, when you became a believer, you became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. What church is that? That's a church in Jerusalem and other churches around it. What happened there when the gospel spread and people got saved? You know what happened. You read it in the book of Acts. Many of the Orthodox Jews began to persecute and martyr Christians. Stephen was the first martyr, but there were others. And Paul reminds them, look, you, you became like the churches in Judea who suffered persecution, and they killed the Lord Jesus, and they even killed their own prophets. There he's talking about Israel. Israel killed some of their own prophets that God sent them, and then they killed the Lord Jesus, Paul said, in verse number 15, and it says, they, they please not God and are contrary to all men. What kind of persecution was it? It was slaughter. They slaughtered the prophets. They killed the Lord Jesus, 
silence in verse 16, Paul said, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Uh, when Paul tried to share the gospel, he was, they would try to silence him. And by the way, again, we're going to see this here in America. When you simply get, stand up and preach the word of God, what God has to say, there's going to be political movements to silence the church and people who speak the gospel, the word of God. It'll happen. Silence. And notice what Paul says in verse 16, the latter part, when he says, to fill up their sins all way, for wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. What does Paul mean by that? Paul's referring to God's wrath on those that they, who rejected Christ, the Jews that persecuted the church in Judea. He's talking about how the God poured out his wrath, which led to really the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And throughout history, we've still seen some of God's wrath revealed against those who have persecuted his people. But then also separation, look at verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your faith with great desire. Paul was in Thessalonica for a very short time, and he was forced to run for his life. And you know why? He went to the synagogue, tried to preach Christ there. The Jews didn't want him. A few heard, and a few got saved. So Paul went to the Gentiles. He started preaching Christ there. But they began a riot in the city of Thessalonica where Paul had to end up running for his life to get out of the city. And Paul says, you know, I left. My heart's still there. I didn't want to leave. I had to leave. I tried to come back. But then here's the next thing. Satan hindered us. Look at verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. The word hinder here pictures a, a road so broken up that travel is blocked. And you mark it down, friends, Satan will do anything and everything to try to hinder the ministry of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Satan hindered us. He wants to thwart the kingdom of God. But Paul's whole point here to the Thessalonians is, look, when you are persecuted and you suffer for your faith, you join a long line of godly saints who have gone on before you. You know what I pray? I pray that if that ever comes to me or to anyone here, that we will be as faithful to Christ as they were. That we will stand firm just like they stood firm. And by the way, if, if you're chosen to suffer, that's a, that's a privilege. God doesn't just choose anyone to suffer for the faith of the gospel. Listen to Acts 5.41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. When you stand firm under persecution, God says you have a big reward coming. And this is the third and final thing. How do we stand firm? There's the Bible within us. There are the believers around us. But here's the third thing. There's the blessings before us. Look at verse number 19, what Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. For those who faithfully stand firm there will be eternal rewards. When, and when Paul wrote this, he's not writing with regret. You, you can see the joy in his words. He's looking ahead, rejoicing. He knew what lay ahead for believers that were faithful to Christ in difficult times, for believers that stood firm to Jesus Christ. You know what we need to do? We need to take the long view of things, not the short view. We have to have an eternal mindset. We have to live our life for the eternal rewards that we're going to get, not the rewards here. It should be, you know what should motivate us? The fact that one day we're going to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And right there, he will give an evaluation of our life and ministry here on earth. And you know really what he wants from us? It's not really hard. He wants faithfulness. He just wants you to be faithful. 
Can you say that about yourself? You're faithful to Christ. You're faithful to worship. You're faithful to his word. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, will you be ashamed or will you be glorified by our Lord? Will you be praised by Jesus? That's what Peter told the believers that were suffering. He said, look, you know, stay faithful because there's going to come a time when Jesus returns. There'll be glory. There'll be praise. There'll be rejoicing. Not the, he wasn't talking about the glory of Christ there. He's talking about the glory for believers who stood fast. That's when you'll get your reward. That's when you'll get praise from God. And that's what we're looking for. And so in verse 19, Paul is filled with great anticipation for this future glory. He calls it our hope. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? The word crown is the word that was used when an athlete would win a competition. They would give him this wreath, this, this ivy crown that he would wear. It was a corruptible crown. But one day when you serve Jesus Christ at the judgment, you know he's going to give you an incorruptible crown if you've been faithful. Paul said, this is our crown of rejoicing. The New Testament mentions many crowns. There's a crown of righteousness for those that long for the coming of Christ, a crown of glory. That's for those who minister their word as a pastor. There's a crown of life for those who persevere through trials. There's the incorruptible crown. But Paul refers to the believers here as his crown. Look in verse 20. He says, for you are our glory and joy. The you is in the emphatic. Paul says, you really will be my crown at that day. You know what Paul is saying? That the joy for him, the reason he endured such persecution and all the things he had to go through for the sake of the gospel was to, for the joy of knowing that there will be people in heaven that he helped to get there that he ministered to, will that be true of us? When we get to heaven, will we be able to say there are people here because God used me? And that is a very, very wonderful, humbling thing if God could use a sinner like me to help someone know Jesus Christ, to minister to them, to share the gospel with them, and for them to be in heaven. Will there be anyone that will come up to you in heaven one day and say, look, I just want to thank you for being faithful? I want to thank you for how you influenced my life. Paul said, that's my reward. That's the thing that's my joy and my crown of joycing. There'll be great joy in the presence of Jesus Christ. But friend, we can't do that if we don't stand firm for Christ. So when the Christians in Thessalonica read this letter, it had to encourage them greatly. They were going through suffering, intense persecution, and Paul was saying to them, basically, look, don't give up. Don't give up. You've done well. Lay hold of the spiritual resources you have. You have the Bible within you. You have believers around you. You have the blessings before you. Do not give up. Do not give up. Stay faithful. In the uh, book written by Annie Graham Lotz, she told a story in her book, Heaven, My Father's House. And you've probably heard this story before. It's a story of an old missionary named Samuel Morrison who had been a missionary in Africa for 25 years and had endured so much hardship for the sake of the gospel. And he finally was returning home. He was finally broken in health. He could do no more. And he returned home on an ocean liner, and it happened to be the same ocean liner that President Teddy Roosevelt was on. He was coming back from Africa on a hunting expedition. And when the ocean liner got close to the dock, there was a, a big band there with banners, and people were welcoming home the president with great, great joy. Police escorts were needed because of the masses of people that were rushing onto the president, mobbing him. They were kind of giving a, a ticker tape type parade. And when all that whole entourage left, Samuel Morrison was there walking off the boat by himself. There was no one else there. He couldn't even get a cab to take him to where he needed to go. And in his heart, he began to wonder, you know, complain a little bit. You know, the president was in Africa for three weeks. He comes home and the world goes crazy. I've been in Africa for 25 years giving my life to serve my Savior. Nobody even knows that I'm here. 
And then in his heart while he was questioning, God seemed to give him a thought in his mind, and the thought was simply this, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. Your homecoming is still in the future, and it will be glorious. For those believers who stay faithful to Jesus Christ, it'll be a wonderful homecoming. So we must stay faithful. Let's bow for prayer together. So, Father, thank you for the encouragement that Paul gives us through the words that he gave to the Thessalonians. Lord, it's our heart's desire that we stand firm. Lord, we are so thankful for all the blessings that we enjoy, especially here in our country where we don't suffer the same persecutions that others do. And yet, Lord, we wonder, what if, what if it did come? What if the freedoms that we had stopped? And what if we had to pay a price for what we're doing here this morning? Would we stand firm? Would we continue on? Lord, I pray by your grace that we will indeed, like the Thessalonians, just continue to be steadfast. That one day when we finally get home, we'll hear you say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. God, grant that we be faithful, that we be faithful to serve you. Lord, you are worth all of our life. You gave yourself for us on Calvary. Oh, Lord, help us to give ourselves fully to you in gratitude and praise for what you've done for us. And heads bowed, eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in Christ, I would just say this, that he loves you and he desires to be your Savior and Lord right now. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Would you be willing to reach out in faith and say, Jesus, I know you gave yourself for me on the cross. You paid my sin debt. And I'm turning today from my sin. I'm turning to you. Save me, Lord Jesus. And friend, if you do that, he will. He'll save you. That's all it takes. Reach out in faith. Would you be willing to do that? Lord Jesus, be merciful. Save me. And beloved, if you're already a child of God, would you just pray and say, God, Help me to stand firm no matter what may come. Give me the grace, the strength. Help me to lay hold of the divine resources that you've given me to stand firm in the faith. And I pray in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.